Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Noir Histoire. I'm Natasha, and in this episode, I'll be discussing the book Negroes and the Gun. Negroes and the Gun by Nicholas Johnson grabbed my attention from the beginning. While the book includes stats, figures, and general events, much of the history of armed black self-defense is told through the experiences of historical figures. In some instances, I'd heard about these events, but the author takes special care in describing the mood and providing details. This allows you to imagine yourself witnessing these events in your mind's eye. What could have been a boring topic springs to life because it's told through these riveting stories and personal accounts. The major and somewhat surprising point of the book is that it reconciles the widely known nonviolent tactics of the civil rights movement with the lesser known reality that black people have a tradition of owning and using firearms in self-defense. Dating back to slavery and even all through the civil rights era, throughout the South and especially in rural areas, black people had been using firearms to hunt but they'd also been using firearms to protect themselves and their families, especially in circumstances where the government and or law enforcement were either unable or unwilling to provide protection. Negroes and the Gun explains the rationale behind why even people who participated in the civil rights movement and subscribed to the tactics of nonviolence still use firearms as a tool of personal defense. Black people are a minority within America, and thus utilizing political violence would be an emotional rather than logical response to systemic racism and inequality. Violence, or guns in particular, could not be used as the first resort or even as a primary weapon in the fight against racism. The simple fact is that black people do not have a large enough population or adequate resources to wage a direct fight against the United States military or even just law enforcement. Most countries don't. Therefore, it made more sense to utilize strategy rather than emotion and preserve the moral high ground by relying on nonviolent political action. Armed self-defense became a last resort in personal conflicts where little to no other alternatives for self-defense could be relied upon. It's pointed out throughout the book that both many popular and less well-known figures in black history subscribe to the ideology of political nonviolence while also believing in the right to personal defense of oneself, family, and home with guns. At first, it sounds kind of crazy, because how can you be nonviolent while at the same time being okay with defending yourself with guns? But it makes sense in reading about the individual experiences of the various figures within the book. Given the choice, they would prefer to live in peace and not bother or be bothered by anyone. But in going about their everyday lives, and especially in instances where pushing for change, they will often face with the threat of violence. With no protection and in circumstances hostility from law enforcement, they had no choice but to arm and defend themselves. Imagine, whether you're a man or a woman, you and your family are living in a neighborhood in a town where you're deemed second-class citizens and experience all of the disrespect and inequality that distinction signals. You join local organizations and participate in peaceful protests aimed at bringing about change. In response, racists drive through your neighborhood, destroying property, throwing firebombs, shooting indiscriminately, and otherwise terrorizing your community. And you can't call the police a sheriff because law enforcement is also participating in these terrorist acts. You might also be under the added discomfort of being in an isolated rural area. These were the circumstances under which many black people were living. Most people would exercise the very human response of trying to defend themselves. And I think that's part of why some black people back then and quite a bit of young people now recoil at the imagery that depicts the fight for black rights as black people being beaten and assaulted while seeming to passively sing hymns. The images feel unnatural because they're at odds with the human response of fighting back when struck. It's no one's fault that they were a victim, but most people do not want to be victims. And wanting something to be proud of, people in turn, they turn away from the images that might be incorrectly regarded as weak or passive. Some go so far as to say what they would have done under those circumstances. This is without fully understanding that having grown up in those times and being accustomed to, though uncomfortable with the social practices, they would have been different people. Without those first-hand experiences, you are not in a position to say what you would have done. The book starts with a bang as the first chapter details the life and experiences of Robert Williams, president of the Monroe, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP. 
Williams was an active presence in the civil rights struggle, but is less well known in comparison to other figures. This is in part because he was most active in the 1950s, but was less publicly visible by the early 1960s after his falling out with the NAACP. It's also possible that he has a lower historical profile because unlike other figures in the struggle for civil rights, he eventually turned more fully to armed self-defense. Early on, his chapter received some support from progressive white people, but over time this dwindled as he pushed for more access to resources for black people and publicly showed himself to be a supporter of armed self-defense, which made many people, both black and white, uncomfortable. Often, activists and organizations who remained steadfastly nonviolent would continue to receive favorable coverage from the media, as well as financial support from people outside the black community. This points to why, on a larger scale, some figures and organizations receive continued support from progressive whites, while financial support for others disappeared. Many of the traditional civil rights organizations were founded completely or in part by white people. During the movement, a lot of these organizations were primarily funded, at, or at least in part, by sympathetic white people, usually from the North. Organizations had to walk a fine line because detours from nonviolent tactics or perceived militancy slash radicalism might alienate donors. For example, Johnson explains how, as SNCC and CORE became more militant, they lost outside support, while the NAACP stayed the course, and we see that it's still comparatively a rather prominent organization. Keeping that in mind, it also plays a role in why certain leaders are still rather well known and celebrated, while others are, if not forgotten, then less mentioned. It explains why so much focus is put on nonviolence, and the mainstream history of the black struggle would lead one to believe that black people didn't fight back. It's in keeping with the saying that victors, or at least those who survive, are often the ones who write the history. For example, we get greater insight into the complexities of some of the most prominent figures of the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, the NAACP, etc. It's revealed that all of them utilize nonviolence as tactics in protests such as marches and boycotts, yet all three figures at some point personally owned firearms for their self-defense. In the case of Rosa Parks, her husband and grandfather owned guns that they used to protect her and the rest of their families. Martin Luther King Jr. owned guns and had armed bodyguards until he came into contact with Bayard Rustin, who was a pacifist and eventually, you know, he more fully adopted the teachings of Gandhi. As the Mississippi field agent for the NAACP, Medgar Evers faced constant threats of violence and kept guns in his home and car for protection. The NAACP did not advocate for gun ownership or armed self-defense, but a substantial part of its history was built on providing legal defense for black people who had utilized guns in self-defense. I picked up a lot of new information from the coverage of the civil rights era, particularly with regards to Daisy Bates. Bates was a leader in the Arkansas NAACP who guided the Little Rock Nine in integrating Little Rock High School. Through prior research, I knew the impact racism had on her early life and the personal difficulties she and her husband faced as a result of their activism. Yet despite reading various sources, I had no idea until reading this book that she carried a gun and came quite close to using it on multiple occasions. I've since added her memoir to my list of books to read because it sounds like it's probably pretty good. The name sounded familiar, but I don't think I had any real prior knowledge of the Deacons of Defense, but learning about their role in the civil rights movement blew my mind. After reading about them, I think we need to put an asterisk next to all of this nonviolent civil rights movement business. The Deacons were a loosely organized group that was founded in Louisiana and pretty much provided an armed security presence for participants in the um, movement's marches and protests. For example, leaders and organizations within the movement, such as MLK and the SCLC, were nonviolent, and so they didn't carry any kinds of weapons during demonstrations. But the deacons would be armed and present at the demonstrations, while you know they would remain mostly out of view of cameras. So the organizations could then honestly state that they were unarmed, while still feeling safe due to the notable presence of the deacons, which dissuaded individuals who might have otherwise attempted to harm the unarmed protesters. It's like, I'm here and I'm unarmed marching for my rights, but don't get it twisted, old boy over there is a different story and he will shoot. 
You know, there's also something else interesting to note. The deacons terrified a lot of people, but some of them found the Black Panthers too radical. And some organizations, such as the Black Liberation Army, thought the Panthers were too tame. It just goes to show you that you can't please everybody. It's a bit ironic that groups such as the Black Panther Party would have their legacy be simplified to focus on members carrying guns while ignoring their political activism and community service. On the flip side, you have these icons from the traditional nonviolent civil rights movement where their legacy is sanitized to make them appear as though they were against any form of self-defense, a perpetual turning of the cheek, if you will. The reality is that their ideologies accounted for the complexities of real life. They did not believe in perpetually turning the other cheek or swallowing ill treatment as is often promoted. They simply made the distinction between defending your life or the life of others and committing acts of violence out of frustration or in retaliation. Using logic, they realized that nonviolent protests and other acts of civil disobedience could and likely should coexist alongside personal defense. There was a time and place for both, and they chose the tactic to be used according to what would be the best strategic decision. The laws for personal protection are not made for us, and we are not bound to obey them. Whites have a country and may obey the laws, but we have no country. A quote by William Parker. Dating back to slavery, some enslaved people had access to guns due to where they were located or the roles they played on plantations. As a safety precaution, some areas prohibited slaves from having access to guns, but some slaves, especially those who participated in uprisings or ran away, were able to obtain guns through the underground economy or by stealing them. It's worth pointing out that while black people in free states lived under different circumstances, this didn't guarantee full rights, and in some places they were also barred from buying and or owning guns. Many abolitionists of the time were pacifists, with some being Quakers. In keeping with their views, there was a tendency to support abolitionism, but only under terms by which the enslaved would obtain freedom through nonviolent means. While abolitionists believed that black people should not be enslaved, some still held patronizing white supremacist views towards black people. Radical white abolitionists who were not pacifists were quite fine with using whatever means to push back against slavery. This was especially true in defiance of the Fugitive Slave Law, going so far as to support slaves using guns to prevent themselves and others from being dragged back into bondage. During the Civil War, Confederate soldiers took personal offense at black soldiers taking up arms against them. As a result, they didn't always observe the usual rules of engagement and committed atrocities against black prisoners of war. Learning about these abuses, black soldiers sought revenge when the opportunity allowed. Having lost the war and their identity that was tied to white supremacy, Southerners took further offense at the Union Army's occupation following the war, and especially the presence of black soldiers who many saw as their lessers to rule over. Johnson surmises that some of this resistance to the freedmen owning firearms was fear of retaliation against white people for the atrocities experienced during slavery in the Civil War. There might be some truth to that, but I think more pressing than the fear of retribution was seeing the difficulty in attempting to continue dominating black people who were now free and armed. As Reconstruction came to an end and black codes were implemented with the aims of reviving the conditions and social norms of slave society, a key goal was the disarmament of newly freed black people. No longer viewed as the property of a white person, the newly freed were especially vulnerable because they could expect little to no protection from local government and thus had no choice but to take matters into their own hands the gun became an incredibly important tool of survival. There's a chapter in the book that details how veterans from both sides of the war organized militias. So on one side, former Confederate soldiers and other uneasy white people unified to form militias that would go on to become entities that enforced the racist laws and social codes that were being implemented. On the other side, black veterans formed militias alongside the political entities that emerged to defend the rights and address the needs of the newly freed. In places where black people were the majority, they were subdued through various means. So, for example, whites working as or receiving assistance from law enforcement, black people hoping for government intervention but 
receiving no help or black people assuming that white supremacists would leave them alone if they didn't cause trouble. As would later occur during the civil rights movement, prominent leaders who pushed their communities to stand up and fight back against ill treatment were singled out for murder or ran out of town. Quite often, this would help to break the spirit of survivors and dissuade them from fighting back as a result of them believing that it would be easier to just go along to get along. Quote, this is what opened my eyes to what lynching really was, an excuse to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property and thus keeping the race terrorized, a quote, Ida B. Wells. Many in the South were unwilling and unable to adjust to black people no longer being enslaved and tried to force them into new forms of slavery. Any achievements that pointed to black progress or attempts that black people made to elevate themselves were met with political violence on the part of racist white Southerners. Passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments meant nothing if local and state governments were not respecting them, especially to the point of passing laws that directly contradicted their intent. The federal government abdicating enforcement and only reluctantly intervening in special circumstances left black people in the South to their own devices. As with other areas of society and everyday life where black people face unequal access to resources, they would also have to provide security for themselves. With the shift to the crisis of lynching, there were a few examples that rubbed me the wrong way. Descriptions of lynchings are harrowing because they are terrible, and I expected that from the topic. But I was a little thrown off at points because there seemed to be some victim blaming. There are a few instances where black people fought back, despite likely knowing that the chances of them surviving or being victorious were slim. The author, like other people might, questioned why they didn't just accept the disrespect or assault and likely to live to see another day. At first, I thought the author was being provocative and a bit of an apologist, but reading more closely, I chose, whether it was his intent or not, to view it as a way of pointing out how few choices people had for dealing with these situations, and the reality that quite often when faced with such limited choices and choosing to exercise armed self-defense as a last resort, black people would still be faced with questions about what they could have done to avoid their unprovoked murder or attempted murder. Throughout the book, we have examples of people who are minding their own business, being assaulted or murdered for no reason beyond simply living. For example, it's like, just imagine you have a job. You give notice at your current job because you've received a better offer, only to have your old boss show up at your new job and open fire because he's upset that you made a decision on your own and quit. There's a theme throughout the book of racist white people attempting to control or dominate black people. They're feeling offended at any attempts black people made to stand up for themselves, even just verbally. A minor disagreement might result in a white person violently attacking a black individual or a group of black people. The black person or group would defend themselves, and whether they won or lost, the situation might escalate, just because they had the gall to fight back, right? They would then be met with violence or the threat of violence from lynch bobs or would face legal prosecution, where more often than not, they would be convicted. The point is also made that sham trials before all-white juries were pretty much legal lynchings. Black defendants who were put on trial were all but guaranteed to be convicted, while white people who murdered black people would rarely face prosecution. For some, it came down to a matter of shooting it out and being killed in the process, or surviving and taking the chance of being judged by a biased group of 12. Either way, there were good odds that you would end up being carried by six. I didn't expect it, but Negroes and the Gun also charged the history of black people and guns in the Wild West. The book is at its best during the chapters where an event is, or a time period, is told through the story of individuals. Unfortunately, I thought the book remained interesting until the timeline shifted to the West. It continued to provide examples with the stories of people, but because there wasn't a larger theme or person beyond the West linking the stories, or at least not people that I knew, they kind of began to run together. So the chapter was just one incident after another and lost impact for me. It was actually a bit of a grind to get through. This book is kind of like 
a long peek behind the scenes of the civil rights movement. The sanitized, politically correct story that most people know is pushed aside for the more complex and honest reality of what took place. In a sense, you get the lowdown in some aspects of how it came together. I actually chuckled a little bit at the bit of comedy that surrounded how the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church was commandeered as the gathering place for the planning of the boycott. It's like a nice little tidbit. But another eye-opening chapter is the last one, which covers black people and guns from the civil rights movement to the present. In a bit of irony, we see how things have shifted from the establishment trying to disarm black people in efforts to more easily preserve white supremacy to black community leaders pushing for much of the same under the guise of decreasing gun violence in black communities. Make of that what you will. At first glance, it might seem like the book goes off topic in discussing suicide and interracial violence, but it's all highly relevant to the history of black people and guns. I understood Johnson's perspective in pointing out that violence against black people needs to be addressed regardless of the threat's race. He briefly touches on the role that guns play in suicides, which according to the author's research, accounts for the majority of firearm-related deaths or deaths where a firearm is involved. There's also the topic of, like, what are the factors that cause black urban communities to be so plagued by gun violence despite gun control and having less guns than rural areas? It might spark conversation, but I thought the book didn't delve deeply enough into those areas. To be clear, I'm from New York City do not like guns, and believe in gun control. Years ago, my views were very black and white on the topic, to the degree that I would have been okay with blanket disarmament. I don't think my views have changed drastically, but are just now more nuanced. I believe in responsible gun ownership and would support requiring background checks, registration, and proof or demonstration of proper knowledge and training. Something along the lines of what you might go through to get a learner's learner's permit and um, driver's license. And with that being said, I still do not believe in private ownership of assault weapons. But, you know, I think they're fine for people to use at a gun range. It's like if you think of street legal versus racetrack cars. But with that being said, with time, my views may change again in either direction. And that's the thing about reading books or having conversations with people that at first glance are at odds with your personal beliefs. They challenge you to consider new and different points of view. Living in the South for the past few years has allowed me to better understand the culture around gun ownership. I still don't have a personal interest in guns, but understand that they're more than weapons to some people. In discussing black history with other people, quite often the topic comes up where some individuals are dismissive of the leaders of the civil rights movement because they seem to be so passive and willing to endure abuse. But taking a deeper look and, you know, getting past what we think we know offers a different and more complex view. And that's why I highly recommend Negroes and the Gun, whether you're pro or anti-gun control. It provides a wealth of insight specifically into the history of black people and firearms, which includes but also goes beyond self-defense. Thanks for tuning in. Show notes are available on the Noir Histoire website via the link in the episode description. If you enjoyed this episode and want more book recommendations, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my book review playlist.